Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and as you probably heard by now, Israel's Bereshit lander didn't quite go according to plan. But, hey, they did end up getting to the moon, they flew their spacecraft to the orbit of the moon, which very few countries have managed to do, and more importantly, they put the whole telemetry, all the details, online in real time. Yes, China has landed a couple of probes on the moon, but they do it in complete secrecy. You don't know what's going on until it's successful. In this case, we got to watch the whole thing, and the numbers made a lot of sense to me. So there's two windows that we'll be seeing a lot, but they cut around between them so they're not always in the same place. On the top right, we see what the vehicle is doing. We see temperatures of various components. We see these uh, this group of nine circles showing the activation of the engines. The main engine on the Bereshit lander, I believe, is a Leros 1C, which generates a thrust of 460 newtons. Now, the dry mass of the vehicle is 150 kilograms, and it currently has 200 kilograms of fuel, which means the thrust is, uh, the acceleration is barely comparable to the gravitational acceleration of the moon, but that's fine because they're still moving very fast. Orbital velocity around the moon is about 1700 meters per second and they're slowly bleeding this off at this time. As they slow down more of course the acceleration will get higher and it'll become easier for them to land. When they initiated the landing burn, the spacecraft was about 850 kilometers from the target at an altitude of 25 kilometers and descending at a rate of about 35 meters per second. And one of the first things it does is arrest that vertical speed and keeps it around 22 to 25 meters per second. And then it starts to slow down on the, the horizontal speed, trying to slow down enough so it can land. Anyway, for the next eight minutes or so, things more or less go as planned. The speed drops and uh, they try to explain what's going on to the local VIPs. Also, uh, representatives of the X Prize, Peter Diamandis, and notably Anusha Ansari were there. Anusha Ansari is interesting because she came, or she originally was born in Iran. So to come to Israel and see them land on the moon, you know, it, uh, it's pretty cool. Anyway, just before the locals get bored, they bring up this nice picture, small country, big dreams, uh, showing the spacecraft over a bunch of craters which internet sleuths have already identified. It's in a region north of the Sea of Serenity, as you would expect, because they would be heading south over it. Except that it's actually not quite in the right place, so many people think it came from a previous orbit. This is a close-up as seen from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, but it's much easier if you take that big crater and then you rotate it and you see how everything all kind of matches up here. I don't know, that's the best example I've got. The people on the internet are amazing at tracking these things down. Anyway, of course, they kept this up for a very long time and then things start to go wrong. At this point, the engine has been burning for about 8 minutes, they're moving over 900 meters per second and then something comes over the control loop. IMU time not okay. The IMU is of course the inertial measurement unit, that's the piece of hardware that tells the spacecraft which way it's facing, or what speed it's rotating, what how much it's accelerating, and it's very important if you're trying to navigate a spacecraft. But then the next thing that happens is we get a telemetry dropout. The panel on the left shows no engines firing, but I'm pretty sure they're still supposed to be firing, it's just they're not getting a signal. All the values are frozen at this time. The data for this was being supplied via the Deep Space Network with the assistance of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Uh, obviously, it's not clear whether this fallout is due to a problem with the spacecraft or the DSN. I suspect it was the spacecraft. Now, the telemetry sort of comes back, and at this point, the descent rate has increased to 33 meters per second. That's about 10 meters per second faster. And the tilt angle is starting to flatten out. That means the spacecraft is turning so that it's no longer decelerating in its orbit. It's now pointed upwards according to the inertial measurement unit. But we continue to get dropouts on the telemetry. Note also that the panel on the right with the model of the spacecraft, that is getting updates, but the panel showing the spacecraft status on the left isn't getting anything until the data starts coming back. And when it comes back, it is now moving downward at about 50 meters per second. But more importantly, underneath it, the accelerometer 
is showing very low values for the acceleration. It's showing 0.6 meters per second. And that's kind of curious. It's burned about 20 kilograms of fuel in the time that it took during this dropout. The vertical speed is accelerating. And I think this 0.6 may actually be an erroneous value because that is actually the acceleration the spacecraft would feel due to its orbital velocity, the centrifugal acceleration. So I believe at this point the spacecraft is basically free falling and the engines aren't generating thrust. We're not sure what's really going on. We don't even know if the orientation is correct at this point because of the IMU failure. Now, it's basically moving towards the surface. I did some math and I figured out that once the speed gets over about 100 meters per second and the altitude is about five kilometers, that is the point of no return. At that point, its thruster, which I believe generates about 460 newtons of thrust, that does not have enough thrust to pull it out of the dive. And that is coincidentally the same time where they try to reset the computer. They call for a reset and the thing is now restarting everything. Maybe, you know, rebooting the thing as it's falling towards the moon will fix it. But there's no way this was going to get rebooted in time. So we're treated to some shots of the controllers looking rather anxious as they realize, some of them doing the math in their head, that there's no way that this is going to recover from it. It is moving downwards under the force of gravity. It is moving sideways at 900 meters per second. I, I can't honestly say that everybody in the control room or viewing this has done the math in their head, but I'm pretty sure at this point they all know it's going to crash and they're trying to figure out who to blame for this. But of course the pragmatic individuals will realize that this is far greater achievement than most countries manage and certainly greater than any other private organization has. The lander delivers a moment of telemetry telling us it's 2.3 kilometers up descending at 133 meters per second and this is the moment. Boom, last piece of telemetry, 149 meters up 134 meters vertical velocity, 946 meters per second vertical. It was probably about 100 kilometers short of its target, and it is now spread over the moon. It's kind of sad watching that final moment just hang there waiting for another frame of telemetry that will not come. But on the bright side, the Lunar X Prize people did give them a $1 million prize for getting as far as they can. They did. And I believe they're now already in discussions to build a sequel and, well, you know, best of luck to them. And now on to the other big event, the Falcon Heavy. I'm sure you've all seen it by now. It was awesome, <laughs> right? 27 Merlin engines. This is, of course, uprated from the Falcon Heavy that flew last year. It's got about 10% more thrust and it's carrying a payload that was significantly heavier, heavier than Starman. We get some nice tracking shots from the ground camera. You can just about make out that that center engine is running at only about 70% thrust. Of course, they're all filled up with the same amount of fuel, so the core has to burn at a lower rate so that it still has fuel in reserve once those outside boosters detach. The new camera setup, of course, gave us great views of these boosters, you know, clutching each other in an epic embrace of power as they work together to lift this payload up towards space. The center camera is mounted higher up, so uh, during stage separation, you of course get to see this boosters coming away and the arms, the struts, folding back, which is kind of, you know, I love the look of that thing. And then, of course, you have the synchronized stages turning around. And the best part of this whole turnaround and descent is you can catch glimpses of each booster working together. It's kind of, I don't know, it, it's really kind of magical to watch this happen. Of course, those boosters are heading back to the launch site because that's the only place they have a place to land. They only have two drone ships, so uh, if they had three, they could land them all at sea, but not in this case. Now, uh, the center core is a special version of the Falcon 9. It has to be reinforced, it has to have extra struts. The ones on the side are apparently generic Falcon 9, so those could get reused for other missions. There were all fresh cores on their very first flight in this case.
After separation, the centre core only burns for about one more minute. And then you get staging and, of course, the centre core now has to perform the hardest and fastest landing in SpaceX booster history. It's going to travel 967 kilometres downrange and, of course, hit the landing barge. It's going to be moving faster and hotter. It's going to cover 967 kilometers in about nine minutes. Think about that, 100 kilometers per minute. The big downside to having all these individual cameras, of course, is that the images themselves are like one third of normal size. So Elon, I think it's time that we upgraded SpaceX's streams to 4K. I'm really happy that you're streaming at, at 60 frames per second because uh, any amount of detail is always worth seeing. And hey, you know, if you're looking for ideas for the stream, since these two boosters are essentially formation flying, you should have a camera that points at the other booster so we can see these during descent. Wouldn't that be awesome? Of course, this is the usual entry burn to reduce the stress on the boosters as they, before they hit the atmosphere and come down hard. After that, they switch to aerodynamic mode where they start to try to translate across towards the landing site. If you remember, this was where CRS-16 had a problem. And then we get the landing burns and it's kind of beautiful. They started within a fraction of a... They started within a few seconds of each other and then the landings happen not quite at the same time, which is intentional. They thought it was safer. The fact that they both landed at exactly the same time during the first Falcon Heavy was unintentional. Also note that the more distant booster seems to be leaning at a bit of an angle, so it might have had uh, the crush core in the legs absorb some landing force. But that is SpaceX recovering two of their boosters at the same time. Now the question was the third one, because if you remember during the first Falcon Heavy flight, the core booster failed to relight its engine and did a wonderful swan dive straight into the ocean. And of course, we shouldn't forget the second stage, which is carrying that all-important paying customer's payload. Landing on the drone ship, of course, we lost the, sig the feed, but then we got it back and we saw the booster extra toasty. Anyway, there was one other burn they had to make to get the spacecraft into its geostationary transfer orbit, but there was one interesting image that flashed up that a lot of people were asking me about. Before the second engine relit, we got that for just a moment. Well... That is a view from inside the oxygen tank. So this camera is inside the liquid oxygen tank because you can see the composite overwrapped pressure vessels on the edge and we know that those are the helium tanks which are immersed in the liquid oxygen to keep them cooler. Um, now, obviously the spacecraft is floating around in orbit at this point and that means that the liquid oxygen will want to kind of float up. It doesn't want to stay pooled at the bottom of the tank and that is very important that you want to make sure it's there when you relight the engine. So the Falcon 9 upper stage, when it's getting ready to relight its engine, it will use cold gas nitrogen thrusters, just gas pressure from these exhausting out to push the spacecraft forward and therefore make the fuel cut or the oxygen, well both actually, collect at the bottom of their respective tanks so that when they light that engine, it's not sucking in empty space, it's sucking in high density liquids, which will make the engine work and not overspeed, not a encounter any error conditions. Now, we've seen this previously in CRS-4. We got a really good long view of the oxygen tank in this case. Uh, this was obviously a much earlier version of the Falcon 9 rocket at this point, but this was inside the second stage. And this is the engine firing right now. You can see the whole thing has got uh, waves rippling on the surface, but as soon as the engine stops, the stuff starts to float around and collect and move up in zero G. It's really quite an amazing sight to see liquids, this amount of liquid floating around in zero G. And a couple of hours afterwards, Elon surprised everyone by revealing that they had recovered the fairings. So these fairings had clearly uh, done their usual soft landing under power wings, but they hadn't been caught by the boat, by the ship. They had just landed in the water and been recovered. And Elon said that they are planning to refly those on a Starlink launch.
Since SpaceX is the customer, I'm guessing that they're okay with testing hardware which has been in the water. After all, they're worth a few million dollars each. What's also interesting is this new fairing design has a little metal plate on the front. I think it's likely that with the fairings that they'd recovered, they already noted that this part was getting too much heating, so they wanted to protect it a little more so that the fairings would be reusable. So that's kind of cool. Again, examples of how SpaceX is recovering hardware and testing it. Now, as for the other hardware they recovered, well, the side boosters, those are just regular Falcon 9s. Those should be able to be reused at some time. Uh, they've not been subjected to extreme re-entry forces. However, the core is the first time they've recovered a Falcon Heavy core, and also it's the most extreme landing that they've managed to put one through. So I suspect that this one will get subjected to extra testing, and the other Falcon Heavy flights that we see in the future will also fly with fresh boosters. After all, Falcon Heavy is a new rocket, really, and they want to, you know, they want to give their customers good service at this time until they're sure that they can fly them with reflown boosters. There was one other kind of cool thing that turned up on Twitter this morning. NASA Goddard basically said, hey, we figured out that we can put our space telescope onto Starship cargo, including some nice renders of what it might look like, which is kind of crazy. But you know, then again, these space telescope projects clearly take a very long time to get launched. Luvior is kind of really cool because Unlike the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, this really is a proper successor to the Hubble. It works in the same wavelength ranges, unlike the James Webb Space Telescope, which is more about the infrared end of the spectrum. Of course, this thing is huge. It does fold up inside. There's a version that will fold up inside a 5-meter fairing, but there's a much bigger version which would require SLS or, as they've just confirmed, should in theory fit inside Starship. So, of course, no guarantee that Starship will ever fly such a high-value payload, but uh, it is interesting to see that, at least within NASA, NASA is not a monolithic organization. NASA Goddard is more interested in its satellites, whereas Marshall Space Flight Center is much more interested in its rocket, as in the SLS. So yeah, it's been an interesting day, and uh, I think I'll finally get some rest tomorrow. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.